you know, breakthroughs in people's lives and uh, in training us to be able to multiply this all over the place. Appreciate so much Carl's training of us. And now Charlotte is going to come up here and preach. Uh, met them a couple of years ago. Come on up here. and I'm going to pray for you up here. Um, met them a couple of years ago. I actually had the privilege of having them here once before. Uh, maybe it was just Carl. It was just Carl. Okay. And, um, and I just fell in love with Carl's heart. I mean, just he and I, like, burning for the face of Jesus, just like the longing for the face of Jesus, and just have delighted. And, and every time I've heard you, it's uh, unbelievable. I just get so moved by her preaching. She pastors a church in Evanston, and, um, and so she, maybe she wants to tell a little bit more about that. But, Lord, I want to pray now for Charlotte. I thank you for the bright, the bright and burning light that she is. Uh, the, the tenderness of heart, the wisdom that explodes from her teaching and preaching. And, and I just pray you'd bless her tonight. We just welcome her to impart into our hearts. I pray that you open up every person's spirit here in the room to hear the word of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Great. All right. Thanks. And this is on, and it's on. I'm on here too. Okay, everything's good to go. Thanks. It is uh, so great to be here. It's been such a joyful thing the past few days, and what a loving community this is, and a beautiful space, obviously full of lots of artists, artists in music, as well as artists in arts. I don't know. What do you call that? Fine arts. <laughs> um, and uh, it's great and an honor to be here. Uh, so yeah, to say a little bit more about me and Carl and our church, uh, I'm now in my 10th year of being the lead pastor of Reba Place Church in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, it's where Northwestern University is. That's, maybe it's one little claim to fame. Uh, anyway, our church was begun in 1957 uh, by a group of idealistic young believers who felt called to lead their Christian rural environment and go off to serve God in the big city. And so that group of 20-somethings, which included my husband's parents at the time, uh, left there, uh, and they were led by this daring seminary professor. He was a little bit too edgy to stay at the seminary. They kind of booted him out and said, go get some practical ministry experience. And so they went off to Chicago, and they formed, yes, a bona fide commune, as in Acts chapter 2 and 4, you know, where it says everybody held all their possessions in common. Uh, and in this group, they lived and they worshiped, and together they worked to serve the least of these among their neighbors. That group then later expanded the possibility of membership in the church to include others who didn't have to be part of like the financial common purse, didn't have to put all their money in together, but who had many of the same ideals of radical discipleship, giving it all to Jesus, simple living, no sacrifice was too much to make for the Lord. So Carl, my husband, was born and raised in this community. It's both the blessing and the bane of his childhood. And uh, I came and joined it when I was a young adult, like 23-ish or so, over 30 years ago. And the two of us have been so blessed to be loved and formed by this deep community over these many years. Now, there is a reason why I mention all of this. Uh, oh, and I forgot to say. Uh, this sort of kind of religious pedigree bragging, you know, kind of like the Apostle Paul said, I'm, a, you know, some from this tribe and I studied under this person and all. I say this to say that cumulatively in our community, of course, which began long before me, um, we know something of what we speak when we say that radical commitment to Jesus and willingness to take God at his word and willingness to sacrifice one's own comfort for the sake of the kingdom are not enough in themselves to make a life-giving community. I will say that again because it's counterintuitive. Radical commitment to Jesus, a willingness to take God at his word, and to sacrifice one's own comfort for the sake of the kingdom are not in themselves enough to make a life-giving community. 
We know that because our community, I think I can really honestly say, had those qualities in abundance over the years, and yet we still experienced many, there's no way to get around it except saying failures, uh, painful incidents or even, I would say, seasons in our life together. So today, I want to share with you something of my own journey of trying to understand what does make a life-giving community. Through my own healing and walk with Jesus and study of scripture, through working alongside Carl, who's a psychiatrist and you know, does healing prayer, um, and through learning about human development and maturity from a friend we have who's a neurotheologian uh, named Jim Wilder. If you've never heard of that, yes, it's a thing. There is such a thing as being a neurotheologian. Um, and through learning about the, necess the necessary skills for uh, having human relationships go well. And if I listed all the people who were influential, influential on me, it would take too long, so that's enough for now. But all of that has come together to convince me that the foundation of a life-giving, Christ-like community is being a relational community. Being a relational community. Now, as you may suspect, there's a lot of very precise meaning packed into that statement, so that's what I'm now going to take some time to try to unpack for you. And there's no better place to say it than start at the very beginning, the Bible. So here we have Matthew 22. Jesus is asked by a local scholar, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Emphasis and foot added. Note that when Jesus was asked which commandment in the law is the greatest, he didn't rebuke the question. He didn't say, how dare you think any one law is greater than another? He answered the question and said, yes, there is one that's greatest and there's another one that's like it and everything else depends, literally hangs off of those two commandments. There is something more important to know and do than all the others. Okay, just pointing that out. Well, so it's not surprising that Jesus' followers in the early church then continued in this way as they spread the good news of the kingdom of God. So here we have the influential apostle Paul saying in Romans, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment, that's kind of a big blanket statement, don't you think? And any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And Paul goes on in Galatians and says, for the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now. Why am I bothering to take the time to recite for you and show you all these familiar scriptures, which I'm sure the many mature disciples here could quote them to me. It's worth it just to get the full force of kind of all of these things coming at you for what I'm gonna say. So track with me here if you would. James, not to be left out, uh, you do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Peter the Rock, not Dwayne Johnson, Peter. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. And then, not to forget the beloved disciple, John, those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters or liars, for those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. So, the command to love God and love one another is foundational and solid as being a central part of Christian orthodoxy. You know, can we kind of agree on this? I think this is really not one of the controversial issues of our day. You know, I, I think it's pretty solid. Um, and yet, sometimes we can read something over and over and 
uh, think that we know it while still missing something really profound about it. And so a few years ago, I realized that that's what had happened to me with all of these love commands that I've just reviewed a selection of for you today. Have you ever wondered why God commands something that inherently cannot be commanded? Love, that is. You cannot command someone to love another person. You know, love is something that in its very nature must be felt from the heart. You have to woo and win someone's love, not demand it. And you can't buy it either, not the real thing. You know, like in the Song of Solomon, it says, if one offered for love all the wealth of one's house, it would be utterly scorned, right? Well, then you might say, maybe God is interested in a kind of a little bit you know, watered down, a little bit lesser definition of love, um, which means something more like, well, demonstrate outward behavior that you think would please me. Well, the problem with that is, what if we take this phrase, with all your heart, seriously? And then what about the understanding shown in Psalm 51 that uh, King David wrote? And he says to God, you desire truth in the inward being, therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. And later in the Psalm, David recognizes that in the case of repenting from sin, it's not the outward behavior of giving a burnt offering that pleases God. It's the broken and contrite heart, right? Truth from the inside out is what God seeks, I think, generally, across the board. And so I say that these commands to love are ironic. Okay, if you're having a, like, triggered flashback to high school English class, don't run away. I will explain what I mean here. I think these commands uh, to love are ironic because it's like saying, I command you to voluntarily devote yourself to and take genuine joy in me oh, and your neighbor. Kind of hard to get your mind around that, so let me say this one more time. Essentially, God is telling us, I command you to uh, voluntarily devote yourself to and take genuine joy in me and your neighbor. Well, surely God must recognize this irony. I mean, commanding us to do something voluntarily, from the heart even? Why does God choose to do it that way? Now, I like to assume something that Dallas Willard, you know the theologian Dallas Willard, but he used to like to say that God is smart. Can we agree on that? <laughs> that God is smart? So I think this is not just kind of like a divine, oops, didn't, uh, didn't catch that one in the typos. Um, there must be a good reason a mystery worth delving into in this construction of this, these many commandments that God has. Because, you know, truthfully, from a human standpoint, God is kind of sounding pretty desperate here. Um, it kind of reminds me of a time during my sophomore year in college when suddenly and inexplicably, a very popular man on campus, he was the quintessential big man on campus, star soccer player, super handsome. There was in fact a management 101 class that you know, did a business project and they made a calendar of the best looking men on campus. It was decent, everybody had clothes on. This man was Mr. January. So anyway, here's this guy. Uh, and inexplicably, all of a sudden, he takes an intense interest in me. And I say inexplicable not because I'm being modest, but trust me, no one like that had ever been interested in me before. And I know it kind of sounds like the plot of a bad romantic comedy where some guy makes a bet with another guy about dating some unlikely girl, but it, it was, this is real, it actually happened, and he was not awful, he was just unusual for me. And maybe then, not surprisingly, after a season of time, he lost interest in unusual me, and I was left a quivering mass of desperate insecurity. <laughs> the definition of post-relationship pathetic. Um, now, I didn't try to command him to love me, uh, but I did compulsively try to win him back for a little while, and I will spare you the cringe-worthy details. I don't know that anyone here has the capacity to hear that. But hey, I was 19, 19, technically still a teenager, trying to learn to cope with rejection, which I'll tell you a little bit more about my thoughts on that later. We're talking about God here, hello. Shouldn't God know better? 
I mean, commanding love, doesn't God realize that some people just aren't that into him? And yet, in commanding love, God is willing to be vulnerable. God is willing to risk looking pathetic out of love for us. So maybe, just maybe, God wants to question the question. Maybe God wants to adjust the paradigm out of which we're functioning as we think about these whole rules thing to show us that the answer isn't really a rule, but a relationship. I think God wants us to prioritize relationships with God and with other people. Now, okay, I got to this point in my little journey of revelations, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, but you know, maybe using the word love, like romantic love, or at least love that has you know, an emotional component is inappropriate. And yet the Bible is full of the metaphor of the church being the what of Christ? The bride of Christ. And, uh, you know, here's a few scriptures. I know this church seems to know this concept very well. You probably have them all memorized. Um, but if that's not an emotional image, I don't know what is, right? So again, I say, I think that God wants us to prioritize relationships. Okay, so for a moment, we'll set aside this uh, biblical perspective and come at it from a different angle. As you know, I'm married to a psychiatrist. This is actually a good thing. Um, I know, some people think, oh, poor thing, she's always being analyzed. You know? <laughs> anyway, that could be a whole other message, but actually, it's a good thing. This psychiatrist, it's a good thing to be married to. Um, and in this case, I have learned an awful lot about brain science uh, from my husband and other said neurotheologian, Jim Wilder. Um, and they have taught me a lot about how our biological brains enable us to engage in relationships with others. And having particular circuits in our brains up and running is part of what's necessary to, for our brains to run well. I mean, not just to have relationships, but for our brains to be able to do all the things that God wants us to be able to do, be creative and be flexible and all those things. And so this information is coming from neuroscience research, not theology. They're just trying to describe what is in the brain, not necessarily what should be. So for simplicity, we call these parts of the hardware of our brain the relational connection circuits. Those of you all who are here for the seminar heard about this, but I want everybody to be on board with this, so let me explain a little. It's not that our brains can't function at all if these circuits are off. You know, you didn't have a... a a, a, a emotional circuit ectomy. They never leave your brain, they just maybe go dim. You know, it's like the lights aren't on there kind of thing. But if they're dim or off, it's not that you can't think or do anything at all, it's just that they, they function differently, your brain functions differently. And it's really not too hard to learn to identify when yours are off or when they're on. And so just for convenience, we say when uh, your, um, when these circuits are up and running and glowing as they're meant to be, then you're in relational mode. And when they're off, uh, your brain is functioning in non-relational mode. So you don't need an fMRI or a PET scan or something to uh, see uh, which, which mode your brain is in. You can learn to identify it by pausing and kind of taking a little internal emotional inventory. So specifically, when you're in relational mode, you, you feel connected to other people. I mean, not literally like you're touching them, but you, you feel like, yeah, we're all together in this you know, warm thing. Um, you are generally glad to be with them and you know, feeling that joy of community you can feel. And even strangers, for that matter. You may meet uh, people that you never met before in this service here, but you, if you're in relational mode, you kind of think, oh, I'd probably like getting to know that person, or that person probably has a story that would be interesting to hear, that kind of thing. You perceive them as unique and valuable human beings. You feel a compassionate concern for what they're thinking. If, in fact, even if they have like a negative look on their face, you might think immediately instead of, oh no, you might think, oh, I wonder if they're something, something's wrong. You know, I should ask how they're feeling. So in your, when you're in relational mode, you think like this. And you might see the person also as a resource, like you're on the same team. Now, 
In contrast, you can tell these circuits are dimming or off and you're in non-relational mode when you really, the more you don't feel connected to other people and furthermore, you don't really have any interest in being connected to them. Like people, who needs people, the earth, people are like a virus on the face of the earth. Okay, this is sort of non-relational mode. You're not particularly glad to be with them and you perceive them either as part of a solution you need or an obstacle to be moved. So like nothing personal, but I need to run over you because you're in my way. And you don't really care about what they're thinking or feeling, except as maybe you maybe could use to manage or manipulate them for some purpose of your own. Okay, so let me try to tell you the significance of all this. When you're in relational mode, your brain is in that mode as God intended, not only are you happier and other people are happier to be with you, but you're able to make decisions on the basis of your heart's true chosen values rather than on this kind of fight or flight, every man for himself or every woman for herself kind of uh, instinct. Furthermore, um, in relational mode, you're able to collect, connect more fully with the Holy Spirit. It's like the same hardware of the brain that enables us to connect to God as well as to other people. And that means that you're better able to receive the Spirit's creative, life-giving, wise guidance for your situation. I think Pastor Mike must be relational when he's getting words of knowledge. In relational mode, you still care about what other people you are interacting with are feeling and experiencing, so you're much more likely to say or do something that God can use as an avenue of appealing for them. When you're relational, you're living from the heart that Jesus gave you. Now, on the other hand, when you're non-relational, you're a lot more likely to say or do something that you regret. Uh, something that doesn't reflect the person that you really want to be or the new heart that Jesus gave you when you surrendered your life to him. Problems are much more likely to seem more important than the people involved. Your decisions are going to be driven to a much larger extent from fear and anger. And a violent solution to the problem is going to seem more reasonable as a reasonable possible choice when you're non-relational. So in some Sinning is, or missing the mark of God's kingdom ways is a lot easier the more non-relational you are. It's like the right kind of medium for a germ culture to grow in is be non-relational and sin increases. On the other hand, love will come much more easily when you're in relational mode because then you actually care about what the other people around you think and feel. Now, you might expect that big things like, say, a terrifying car accident or something will cause these brain circuits to go offline and you go non-relational. And that's true, that does happen. If a person is subjected to a painful emotion that's beyond their capacity to handle, it's like the breaker in your house flips if you put too much current through it, they're going to flip into non-relational mode. But closer to home, you know, you don't have to have something that's on the nightly news for us ordinary people to get flipped into non-relational mode. It just has to be something that hits one of your particular personal hot buttons um, that you have acquired over the course of your life experiences. So you're driving home and someone cuts you off on the highway. I know that never happens here in California. Um, take that emotional inventory. Do I feel connected to that guy? Glad to be with him. Does my mind graciously jump to reasonable explanations about why he had to get in front of me there? Like, he's taking his child to the hospital, or no, probably not. More like only an idiot would drive like such a jerk or something more colorful. Um, so no, you're non-relational then. Or what about something like your friend forgets your birthday, and when you next see him, he goes on and on about this terrific new coworker he's got. All right. Do you feel glad to be with them? Do you feel connected? Maybe not, you're non-relational. Or your spouse gets angry at you for forgetting to pay a bill on time. This is merely hypothetical. Um, so now there's late fees and maybe finance charges and in a condescending tone of voice, they begin to lecture you about being more responsible. Do you feel connected to them? Uh, like uh, you're glad to be with them? No? Okay, you're going non-relational. And how about this one? You pray and fast for your friend to be healed of her cancer, but she dies. Do you feel connected to God? Glad to be with God. 
perceive you're on the same team with God, etc. You know, so it can happen for many different ways and reasons that these circuits kind of go dim or off in our brain. Well, since becoming aware of the relational connection circuits and starting to deliberately try to monitor myself, you know, I kind of got my little third party eyeball out here watching, am I relational right now or not? Um, I have been sobered by how often I have found myself uh, slipping into being non-relational. I never say consciously, that's it, I'm, you pushed me too far, I'm flipping the switch, you know. I, I don't say that, I know that's not the right answer. Um, but after the switch has flipped, I can really feel the difference in myself and so can anyone around me who has to relate to me. And what's even more sobering is that when the switch goes off, it's off for all relating, even with God. You know, you, so not just towards the guy on the highway who cut me off, you know, but for the time while those circuits are off, while I'm still ranting in my mind or out loud um, about that lousy driver, I'm not really glad to be with anybody or having joy in anyone's presence. Okay, so there is a reason why I'm telling you all this. To illustrate how these points came together for me, I'll tell you a little bit about my own journey of faith and life. So, um, I experienced a lot of pain in my life, especially in my early life, around the issue of shame. You know, this came, I'm sure, from a number of different perspectives. Being a biracial person in this country will do it to you. Um, I'm Japanese on my father's side and uh, Euro-American of Dutch and English extraction on my mother's side. And at least at, when I was a kid growing up in the New York metro area, that kind of made me feel like I had no place to belong anywhere. Um, and didn't look like you were supposed to look. I remember many days in junior high wishing I could just look normal. What's that? You know, but anyway, that's what I used to tell myself. If I could just be plain like everybody else. Um, and there were some incidents of feeling rejected even in my own family that didn't have to do with biracial but other things. And all that to say is I became all about avoiding shame. And I learned how to do a lot of my life behind a wall. Like I was thinking about this earlier and it made me think of one of those times um, uh, I saw a president or head of state you know, doing a speech in a, I guess it was sort of a vulnerable venue and there was this like bulletproof plexiglass you know, around them. That, so you didn't notice it if you weren't looking at the right angle, but if you looked at the right angle, you're like, ah. Oh. Well, there's something between him and that crowd, you know. So was, that's the image I have. Sort of, I learned to do life kind of behind this wall. People would only get so close. Um, and I really developed a almost a superpower in obeying rules. <laughs> uh, it might be little things like no trespassing. This is much to the annoyance of my husband Carl, who's a bird watcher. Bird watchers think no trespassing signs do not apply to them. Um, I, however, would always want to follow the rules. If it said don't, I didn't. Um, nevertheless. Uh, or it might have been more important things, like when I was in high school, uh, I was really good at resisting peer pressure to do destructive things and I was good. Um, so all of this was in hopes of guaranteeing God's and people's approval of me, avoiding shame. Well, it turns out that I had developed this pattern of coping with life in which whenever pain threatened to come my way, I would retreat into this non-relational mode. Now, not swearing and fighting, but non-relational nonetheless. And I really thought I was doing pretty well. I mean, I thought I was way up there at the top of Christian performance. Um, not, I was doing the do's and not doing the don'ts of the rules. Uh, but okay, it was really easy and common for me to be pretty judgmental of others when I was non-relational. Um, I mean, I wouldn't let the words come out of my mouth usually, but inside, if I felt hurt by someone, I really did think that any idiot should have known better than to do that. And certainly I would have made a better choice than he did. Um, and okay, it was pretty easy and common for me to be not that sensitive to what other people were feeling when I was non-relational, which was a lot of the time. And so I often responded to their hard times and their emotional pain with a kind of, let's hurry up and fix you, uh, fix this mess that you're making, rather than just being able to love and accept them. And okay, it was really easy and common for me when I felt the least bit rejected or even just unaffirmed 
to step into non-relational mode as I would distance myself emotionally from those who were around me. And I'd often just kind of coincidentally at that time find myself wondering whether I was really feeling called to another church or another job or another state perhaps. And I had been using this non-relational attempt to escape from pain for so long that I really had no vision of what it would be like to be angry, to argue, maybe perhaps to discipline a child if I had one, while still being relational. I really don't think I thought it was possible. So that meant all I was left with was chronically stifle my anger and then occasionally explode. <laughs> I would not recommend this. So, as I was going through all of these thoughts, it finally came to me, do you realize that you could refrain from murder, adultery, covetousness, lying, stealing, using God's name in vain, a lot of the top 10 commandments, right? Or not even honoring the Sabbath, even if you're non-relational. You can do all those commands from being non-relational. You can march for peace. You can eat only locally grown food. You could lobby to end abortion. You could even preach about salvation in nations where that is a capital crime, all while being non-relational. I'm not saying that you're going to be most effective at doing those, those things while you're non-relational, but you can do them. However, you cannot love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself, if you are non-relational. Hmm. And so this all added up to me to a realization that I had made rules most important and relationships somewhat expendable, too painful. And now I was beginning to see that God says that relationship is most important and rules are not unimportant, but secondary. Relationship is most important and rules are secondary. You could also say it this way, in order to carry out the biggest, most important rule, I need to become a person whose priority is not rules, but relationships. Now, I really resisted this truth at first. Um, I felt like I came from a culture that like idolized soccer and I'd worked really hard to become an impressive player and then suddenly I'm transplanted into a culture where nobody cares about soccer. It's baseball everybody learns and cheers about. And I'm like, oh, that's not fair. I was doing my best. I thought I was doing what you wanted, God. And furthermore, I had really good reasons for protecting myself, even if I was non-relational. It's not fair that I should be getting points off. This is an outrage. But you know, Humility is good, kind of an acquired taste, but it's ultimately freeing. And because of building a habit of doing this kind of Emmanuel prayer that Kent was mentioning, that Carl teaches, a way of uh, connecting with the real presence of Jesus, um, I knew that it was good to talk to Jesus about something like this. And, and I knew how to do it. And so as I was ranting at Jesus about this, guess what? He did not get non-relational with me. He listened to my lamenting, all of the pain that I felt. He made it clear that he understood why I had hidden behind my wall of being non-relational to try to protect myself. He cared that I hurt, and he was still glad to be with me. And I really, I know that Jesus has a sense of humor, too, because I felt like that he told me that, all of my strength in doing the right thing that had, been, that had been oriented towards obeying rules could be retooled in the light of this humbling reservation, revelation. It's as if he said here, this will feel more familiar and comforting to you. I'll give you a new rule. Thou shalt prioritize staying relational. So, my friends, <laughs> let's all face the truth that staying relational is not just something that counselors and prayer ministers and pastors and touchy-feely types should do, but something that's central to advancing the kingdom of God as proclaimed by Jesus. It's a conviction and a practice upon which all the other commandments designed to honor God and spread God's shalom depend. Sinning is more likely when we're non-relational, and love is more likely when we're relational. Joy happens when we're relational. Being fully present in the moment at, with God and with others is only possible when we are relational. Do you understand why I believe that a life-giving and Christ-like community 
one that has a healing culture, one that helps people be transformed into the likeness of Jesus, is one that prioritizes staying relational. So, um, I forgot to ask you how long I can go here. Okay, well, I'll keep going then. Um, so in case you're wondering, I thought I'd share some of what our community does that we've tried to learn to do that helps to create a relational culture. So this is just a few highlights, a few tips. Uh, here's the first one, a fairly obvious one. Learn to identify when you are relational and when you're not and prioritize staying relational, okay? Like, become that mindful about yourself. Do that little emotional inventory now that you know that being a relational or not relational is a thing and it's important and God cares about it. It's like a new category you have to add to your spiritual disciplines and I would argue, as you can tell, it should be way up there in your spiritual disciplines, not like down there with make sure you at least have a serving of broccoli every week or something. I don't know. Nothing. I love broccoli, actually. Um, but it's, it's a really important one. So I gave you that, you know, sort of checklist earlier. You can catch yourself sliding into that fight or flight, irritable, non-relational mode. And then a quickie just to say getting back to being relational again, pausing, stopping, practicing gratitude and appreciation. There's a lot more you could do about that. I was going to refer you to say, oh, my husband Carl's book called Outsmarting Yourself has all this stuff about identifying when you're relational and getting relational again, and we, they all sold out at the conference. So um, maybe we'll get more books here at some time, but otherwise that would have been a good resource for you. But let me tell you this one story. Um, that I think illustrates the value of prioritizing staying relational. So we have an open mic time at the end of most of our worship gatherings at our church. Now, I know pastors who hear this tremble with fear. Oh my, that's crazy. Um, we know it's a risk because crazy things can happen when you do not rigorously control who comes up to the mic. Um, but, you know, we're a smaller church than this, and we put such a high value on authenticity that for whatever reason, we decide to, we do it anyway. And so uh, one Sunday, I was shepherding the sharing times a number of years ago, and a young man who I'll call Robert, uh, he only attended very infrequently, and he came up to, the, uh, to me at the mic and said he had something he wanted to share an answer to prayer. Well, that's great. We love hearing answers to prayer. So I hand him the microphone. Some would say that was the first mistake. But anyway, I handed him the microphone, and... He says about how last week the congregation had prayed something about his eyesight, and this week it was so much better. Hooray! Thanks for praying. Yay! Everyone's cheering. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, he goes on this rant about his friend, we'll call her Jane, who had come with him that Sunday, and how nobody was being friendly to her, and she was having a terrible experience, and this was awful. And then he literally threw the microphone over his shoulder, <laughs> down and stalks off. Wow. So now you should know that thinking fast is not my forte. <laughs> Note the manuscript from which I am speaking. I am a planner. <laughs> um, but at moments like this, ah, you know, you revert back to those uh, things that you have done spiritual disciplines about. You, you know, you fall back on your training, so to speak. And so the deep conviction that whatever else you do, stay relational. You know, so because you want to try to learn to major in the majors, not the minors of the commandments, right? So, okay, I know I shouldn't shoot him, don't kill him, <laughs> but I can hate him, right? Well, that would be, you know, mixing things up a little. So, okay, whatever else you do, stay relational. Well, thankfully, picking up the microphone, time to breathe, yeah, and, and then, since I was... You know, this was, um, it was kind of shocking, but, you know, things like this happened before. Thankfully, Robert doing this didn't actually hit one of my personal hot buttons, so it didn't trigger me. It just was kind of shocking, and I might have been defensive in response. So I was able to remain relational by just kind of breathing and remembering that that was important. So I stood up, and because I was relational at that point, I turned, and I happened to make eye contact with his friend Jane, who's sitting there in the risers, and I said, you know, what naturally came out of my mouth, again, because I was relational at that moment, was yeah, obviously Robert's pretty upset. Um, 
But, you know, we won't assume that he was speaking for you or at your request. Does that seem okay to you? And she's like... <laughs> Um, and then I just found myself kind of musing out loud about, you know, how we've all had experiences of times of trying to go to someplace new, and it can be so hard to meet new people, and um, it's easy to feel left out. And I kind of just kind of, I didn't even actually have the words for it at that moment. Now I know, oh, I was attuning to whatever uh, pain that this person might have been feeling and what apparently Robert was feeling on her behalf and then getting angry on top of it. And as I did that, you could feel the tension in the room just kind of go, and draining out. And I discovered after the service was over that what had started out as a rather low moment in our gathering that morning had become actually a valuable opportunity for all of us to embrace and virtually practice uh, being relational and loving even in the face of weakness and conflict together. Because a whole lot of people came up to me afterwards and talked about their feelings of anxiety, shame, anger, relief, and wonder about it. And we had come through all those feelings together and then come back to being relational and glad to be together. And it felt satisfying. It felt like love. So. Maybe one more, another example from our community's experience of prioritizing a relational culture to fulfill Jesus' commands to love is this one. Learn and practice healthy conflict. Oh, but wait a minute, you're saying, I thought you were saying prioritize staying relational. Shouldn't you be avoiding conflict or discouraging it at the least? And no. I'm convinced that much of why we become non-relational in community, communities of Jesus, we're trying to love each other, etc., is because we don't know how to handle the inevitable disagreements that do come up. You know, or at least if you have a community that's, say, of a size of more than one person, <laughs> that in the absence of healthy conflict skills, Otherwise, loving and community-minded people quickly go non-relational. Suddenly, problems are much bigger than relationships, and we're at war. Um, so if we want to stay in the relational state in which our brains can hear from God, creatively solve problems, discern God's path together through this broken world, and nurture Christ-like transformation in one another, we need to build, actually, healthy conflict skills. We need to learn how to remain relational even when we disagree. So that's a whole school of thought of how to do that, but one that we have found to be really helpful is distinguish anger from self-righteous judgment. These, believe it or not, are not the same thing. You can be angry, and yet Paul says what? And not sin, right? Um, However, as I've said in other talks I've done, I think anger, while not being inherently sinful, it has a really short shelf life. If you keep it around very long, it spoils in a big, nasty way. So while anger itself has a purpose in God's plan and is necessary, and we shouldn't try to have an anger ectomy, it's impossible anyway, um, but... Uh, we do need to make it separate from judgment because judgment gives anger a bad name. Judgment gives anger a bad name. Judgment gives Christians a bad name. Sadly, a lot of people probably judgment's one of the first few words they would come up with on a word association with Christian. We really need to change that, folks. We work at communicating so, to make this distinguishing, we work at communicating without resorting to being judgmental, even of those we strongly disagree with. So it's not saying don't disagree, you gotta discern and say what you think. So we say, yes, express your disagreement as we discern and about whatever it is together. Healthy conflict is good, but no to judgment. No to those catchy, clever, but judgmental, bumper sticker kind of phrases. And if you're good at coming up with them, I know it's got to be like cocaine to, you know, say them and have everybody laugh. And so long as most of the people in the room agree with your opinion about that, everyone's going to be like, yeah, right on. You know, even if it's a sin that you are judging and promoting judgment of the hearts of those others who disagree with you on whatever that was. So this is really hard. 
But if you don't learn to tease out which is which, then you get Christians who are always trying to be nice, but occasionally explode, that was me before, um, or they inexplicably leave the church because they're angry, but they couldn't say so, um, or Christians who are convinced that they are righteously guarding the truth or speaking the prophetic word from God, but who come across to others as loveless accusers and not helping the cause of Christ. So I say, study the practice of clean anger, relational anger, and practice the spiritual discipline of a lifelong, total fast from judgment. Never do it. Never. Um, so I'm going to skip this last one here. I'll skip over this point. And, <clears throat> and say, let me just tell one last story to kind of wrap up here. I was at this uh, pastor's conference maybe six months ago now, and in conversation with one of my colleagues there, I was reminded of a particularly challenging church situation that I had heard of. And I began thinking about that situation in light of all of this stuff that I've just shared with you today. And this particular church was like, sadly, many churches, it was full of brokenness and sin. We know that affairs happen in churches church communities sometimes, and this church had that going on. Sadly, it was a real hashtag church two situation. Political divisions formed, polarizing the members of this church into opposing camps. Substance abuse was an issue there, even sometimes people coming to church events that way. So basically, this church was one hot mess. And the person who had supervisory responsibility over the church found out what was going on and tried to step in and bring some sanity. Um, but what was really amazing is that he knew that in, in his heart, that even with all this craziness going on, that the Holy Spirit was still present in this community of folks and that they really did on the whole want to follow Jesus. But their own deep brokenness, their lack of maturity to handle the conflicts among them, the dysfunctional patterns that they absorbed from their families or their surrounding culture and not yet gotten free of, all of that conspired together to uh, work against God's reign manifesting more clearly among them. Well, anyway, I've always found it instructive that this church leader didn't give up on them, but instead he coached and counseled them, and while he gave them very specific instructions about how to handle the details of their hot mess, he also gave them a much bigger perspective about how to think about their life together. And so I want to end here this morning with maybe sort of sharing his words and kind of pronouncing them over you. So this is what he said. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, 
but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Amen.